Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about a very, very special class um, that the Rebbe, the last two sikhas that the Rebbe said on this week's parsha is parsha Tzava. And the Rebbe speaks about a very, very important idea. And basically, to understand this idea, the only way we could understand reality, we sort of discussed this the other day, but maybe not everybody was here, so we'll discuss it again. The only way we could really understand reality is like a heartbeat. You know, a heartbeat's a very interesting thing because, you know, there are things that exist and they don't have heartbeats, like a rock. So if God made a heartbeat, it means there's a very good reason why things exist. It's very important to understand that nothing has to exist in the way that it exists. Everything can exist in any single way God wants. But, you know, when you look at reality, there, there, are, there are literally trillions of different realities that are existing in this world. You know, uh, many, many different things like, you know, we used to think, well, you need sunlight for photosynthesis. Well, it turns out that um, you could actually, there are these, you know, heat vents in the bottom of the ocean and you don't need sunlight. You know, there's different systems. God doesn't need any type of system for life to exist. In fact, they asked the Rebbe, if there's intelligent life somewhere else. Um, so, getting back to the subject at hand, we were saying this... Um, what were we saying just now? I lost my train of thought. <laughs> we were saying that... Um, all right, what were we just saying? So, things can exist. There, there doesn't have to be one sort of reality, right? So, it's a very important principle that if Hashem made something, everything, the, the, there's... Basically, in life, there's only one overarching principle to life. And that is that everything that happens is teaching us a lesson, right? If you just remember that one thing, everything that happens is teaching you a lesson. And so life is about growth. It says man is like a tree of the field. Whatever happens is there to teach you. And from the beginning to the end of time, if there's a star, if there's a plant, if there's a bug, everything in the world is there to teach you. So... If God creates a system, the bigger the system is, the more important the teaching is. If there's a system that all of life is based on the pulsation of a heartbeat, that the heart beats and it pulsates blood through you, it means that there's a very, very, very profound idea here of how life has to function. Now we know, in fact, it says that man is Adam. Adam stands for Aleph. Dam. Aleph is God. Dam is blood. God in your blood. God in you. And also we find that this month is called Adar, which is Aleph Dar. That Hashem is dwelling within us right here in this world. So what does this teach us? It teaches us that the way we live a spiritual life in a physical world is by having a connection to something higher. And that's the whole idea of davening. As I mentioned before, if God tells the Jewish people to daven, we're here and we spend at least an hour a day praying. This is like the heartbeat. This is like going back to the source. This week's Torah portion begins with the story of the menorah. And then it continues and or concludes with the story of the Katiris. So every single day the Jewish people lit a menorah which is kind of like our own soul. We're lighting our light, and we are the light unto the nations. It says the man's soul is God's candle. And then it continues with the Qataris. The Qataris are actually the incense offerings. And as we mentioned yesterday, the incense smell is something that the soul has a pleasure from, but not the body. It's not like food that goes into the body. It's only your spirit that actually has a pleasure from smell. And that's why it says three things. When a person is down, there are three things that restore our Spirit, one of them is your um, smell. The other is your... Um, the other is your a good smell, a good sound, and a good sight. Right. So these are not things that the body directly gets a benefit from, but the soul gets a benefit from. The soul gets a lift from. Now, the story of life is a very, 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 very important story because everything boils down to this idea of an inner and an outer thank you reality the inner reality is the essence the essence of course is god there's only one 
there's only truth, there's nothing false. And yet, we live in a false world, a world which is dominated very often by insecurity, and certainly it's dominated by need, right? So the question is, how do you... The, the whole Torah, we see very clearly, God wants us to be holy. How are you holy? Being holy is a very important thing. I think there's a whole book written by one of the great rabbis on be some Kedoshim, to be holy. There's so many different things that are mentioned to be holy. So how does a person actually become holy? What do they do to be holy? So we know that in Judaism, holiness is to be different. If you're just going to be like everybody else, you know, they say even if you're the fattest rat, you're still a rat. So if you're just going to be a rat, I don't know if you ever saw rats in a cage. It's really quite sad to see. They're like, they really, they really fight each other just to get that little bit of water. There's no, there's no, um, no respect. You know, an ant stops and says hello to his fellow ant. Joining us? Absolutely, absolutely. We um, have an open door policy. It's Chabad. <laughs> so, you know, you look at an ant, an ant is very, very polite. They always stop to say hello to another ant. But a rat, they just, they're, they're like fighting their way. So we live in a world in which, it, you know, it could be, uh, you know, a person could think he's a rat race, but that's not the goal of life because really we are divine beings. But the, the, the trick, of course, is how to be a divine being in the physical world. It's not a hard thing to be a divine being outside of the world. The trick is to be a divine being inside the world. And to do this, a person has to reconnect to their essence because on an outer level we can see ourselves and we discussed this yesterday that there's such a thing called disinformation where the uh, kind of secret service of Russia they did I think they still may be doing this they try to influence the public opinion by getting people particularly people that are destructive in a society to come up with a um, negative you know, like this whole thing, I mean, I don't know, I haven't seen it said, but to me it's obvious that once you understand the art of disinformation, is that guy that defected um, from the NSA and he went, he ends up in Russia, right? And then he ends up revealing all the things of the NSA, so why did that happen? Um, what was the name of that boy that, that went there to, to Russia? I forgot his name. Revealed all, like, the NSA is spying on everybody. I forgot what his name is. But in any event, it happened because Russia knows that they can't put a Russian on U.S. television and tell everybody, oh, wow, the U.S. is bad. They'll say, yeah, that's just a Russian thing. But if an American comes, then they can destabilize and they can create distrust within a society because one of your own says it. So you have to take, you have to li listen. You have to take note. Maybe the guy's right. You know, you're, you're like he's got information. So the thing is that we as a human being, we have to like reconnect to who we really are, which is a divine being. And only in that point of connection can we then go out into the world. I'll, I'll give you the very simple example. Is if I am in charge of an army, the first thing I have to do is, in fact, in the, in the Russian army, in the olden days in the Tsar, the first thing they would tell a soldier, they would tell them about the family of the Tsar. And they would tell them about the Tsars, what are the history. In other words, the first thing you have to do is you have to know who you are. You're a soldier of the army. So a person has to come into an army. They have to basically make them feel that they are part of this army. If you don't feel you're part of it, why would you even fight for it? There's no reason. And so this is a very critical thing. Um, in fact, it's very interesting. Ronald Reagan, when he, he was a very great president, but when he left office, the one thing he said that I'm afraid of I'm afraid of a younger generation that is not going to basically love America. Because if the citizens don't love their own country, and this is how all countries, really all empires fail, is that the citizens take their country for granted. They don't love it. And so they're, they're just, they, they basically, they give up what they have because they don't love it. And in fact, many times in life we do this, which is, you know, you could get married and the wife could be a wonderful wife, but you don't appreciate it or you don't love her and if you don't love then it's very easy to lose it because you don't do what needs to be done to keep it it's like that simple and this is this is really takes place on a, on a very profound level on our own body right we have a body now what would you pay 
if, I, if you had a billion dollars and I say, okay, would you give me the billion dollars to keep your arm? Of course. My arm is worth a billion dollars. To keep your health? Of course. So why don't you put your time and effort into eating healthy? Keep your body healthy. The point is that we take things for granted and because we take it for granted, so therefore we don't appreciate what we have because we don't appreciate what we have, certainly as Jews, right? We have a Torah, we have mitzvahs. We may not appreciate what we have. And because we don't appreciate it, we don't cherish it. Because we don't cherish it, we don't take care of it. Because we don't take care of it, so eventually we could, God forbid, so a person has to really have a deep sense of appreciation. Now, we all have a godly soul, a part of Hashem within us. This part of Hashem has to be recognized. It's like the, every day in the base of Migdash, they would light the menorah, they would offer up the incense, and they would remember Hashem. You know, the Baal Shem Tov had, uh, has a teaching that I think he says from a Ram of Kuti, a great rabbi, that God came to this rabbi in a dream and he said that all of Judaism is memory. It's to remember. And think about how many things we do in Judaism. Of course, Judaism is divided into the mitzvahs between man and God and between man and man. Now, so, so many of those mitzvahs between man and man sorry, between man and God, are actually there to remind you about God. Think about it. You have a mezuzah, reminds you about God. Tefillin reminds you about God. Shabbos reminds you about God. Pesach reminds you about God. All these things we do remind us about God. Why is it so important to remember about God? Because there's nothing easier in the world to forget. When things are good, you know, when things are difficult, it's very, very hard to forget your reality. When things are good, it's very, the hardest thing is to remember what it is that is good. As I, one of the quotes on the American passport, they have quotes. One of the quotes is that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Freedom is not a joke. It's not easy to be free. Most people in the world today probably are not free. But if you're not careful on your freedom, you'll probably lose it because somebody would love to be a dictator. So the thing is that in life, a person has to have a tremendous, tremendous respect for those things that are precious in life. And the most precious thing that we have is our soul, our neshama, our very essence. And so therefore, the whole idea of davening, saying shema, the Rebbe says, particularly shema and shema and esri and davening, is there to remind us, to reconnect us to Hashem, and remind us who we are, that I am a godly soul. And it says that when a Jew davens, there's a famous saying that goes like this. It says, Ilu yisif. If I would know God, I would be God. But it says when you daven, you reach that level. Now what does that mean, you know God? Not intellectually. It says in the Kabbalah, you can't know God by your mind. But you can know God in your heart. You can sense. And so when... A Jew davens, a proper davening to Hashem, you have a sense, a sensitivity, an emotion, a feeling for Hashem. And so this is very, very important to understand that davening is not just a Jewish requirement, it's taking your soul. Every soul is a candle, and it's lighting your candle. You know, if you have a, the menorah in the holy temple, and you don't light it, you don't put in oil, what's going to happen? It's going to go dark. And the same thing is with us, for us to be alive as a Jew, for us to be really inspired, to be a flame, we have to light our soul up. And this is the reason why Hashem gave us the beautiful, beautiful gift of prayer. And we know the three pillars of Judaism. It's the pillar of davening, of prayer, the pillar of Torah study. And the pillar, again, Torah study lights us up. Reminds us about Hashem. And again, there is the actual acts of goodness and kindness, the mitzvahs that we are meant to do. And these are the three pillars. So as long as we know who we are, we're a divine flame in this world. And in order to keep the flame alive, we have such a thing called prayer. Because in prayer we connect to Hashem. And we have such a thing as Torah study. Because in Torah study we know, we learn what is the correct way and we can always learn deeper. And last but not least, we have the acts of goodness and kindness, the implementation of the flame and of the study in the real world. And that's basically the whole story. <laughs>